Moving mountains with Pearl. I blogged about this about six months ago, so you possibly have read a blog post about this. Yeah. But I couldn't include any of the photos because they're all copyrighted and I didn't want to infringe on anybody's copyright. And a lot of the point of this talk is more the photos than the actual stuff I'm doing. Um, can you hear me okay? No? A little bit louder? What if I do that? Is that, is that better? Yeah? Tiny bit? Okay. And this is a work in progress. Okay, good. Like, well, that's not an unusual caveat. Um, but especially so, because I have a lot of photo projects and a lot of them are in progress, and you combine that with software and then it kind of goes on and on and on. And that's the breakdown of this talk. So, as I said, there's a lot of photography here, a little bit of pie and um, pearl, and a little bit of physics. But if we're being pedantic, it's really 100% physics. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, December 2017, I started shooting with a large format camera, which is I'll put it here, which is which is this thing. And I, I thought about doing this over the years many times. Uh, as you can see, it's quite a big, bulky, cumbersome thing. It takes me about 10 minutes to assemble it all, and then about 10 minutes to get the composition and the focus, and then 10 minutes maybe to wait for the right moment to fire the shutter. Um, so it's a very long, drawn out procedure to shoot a photo. Uh, but that's not the reason that I didn't do it up until now. It's just that I never really thought of something I wanted to shoot using this camera. And I took it up, took it up a mountain to prove that it's not actually a pain in the ass to use. Um, I did cheat a little here. I used a lightweight tripod rather than this thing, which weighs about four or five kilos. Um, and then I snowboarded back down the mountain with this in my backpack because it all folds up and it's okay. So it's not actually that difficult to use. And that is a resulting photo from what you saw there. If you compare that to the previous photo, I mean, it, there's not much difference really, other than the composition is a bit different and maybe the colors are a little bit nicer. And obviously you can you can zoom in on this a bit more, rather than you can on a, an iPhone because it takes it takes a piece of film that is four by five inches, which is that big. So you can scan that to about on a good scanner maybe two gigapixels, which is quite a big image. But again, that wasn't my reason to use this camera because if you think about how we look at photos these days, we rarely see them this big. We see them on phone screens and computer screens and in, well, not magazines these days, but we, we see them small. And I'd already shot this image a year earlier on a different camera, which is this one. And you, you may have seen me at other Pearl workshops with this camera. And this camera shoots a panoramic frame. So it gives you an awful lot of context. And I find that's quite appropriate for shooting Pearl workshops. You have a choice of different contexts. <laughs> so using that, or using that, or using an iPhone, or using medium format camera, or a 35 millimeter camera, it's not about resolution. and It's about how the camera informs your approach. And when it takes you 30 minutes to shoot a photo, you start to think differently about your approach and why am I doing this and what do I want to achieve. So the question is, why did I start using this? What was the main reason? And the main reason is due to camera movements. So what I can do with this camera is everything kind of adjusts on it. So I can, I can do this to change the, the field of focus. If you think about when you focus a camera or when your eyes focus, you have a plane of focus. And that's limited to a depth of field, we call it. And if you, the example here is shooting a photo of a, a tower in the distance. And I can get the tower in focus, but things before it might be more difficult to get in focus. And we can sort of cheat a little bit by stopping the aperture of the iris down, which increases that depth of field. But with this camera, we have movements. And what I can do is I can tilt the front standard forwards. And what I'll do is I 
And what that does is the back of the camera, the thing that records the image stays at the same plane, whereas the, the focus plane shifts. And an example image I have is this picture of tires at the Silverstone Grand Prix last year. Uh, I thought I like the kind of layout of these tires, but I wanted to get everything in focus. And we have this nice diagonal plane that runs from the front of the image to the back of the image. So there was no way I could shoot this image this way to this level of quality with any other camera. I would have to do a workaround. I would have to shoot lots of photos and then combine them all. Um, or I would have to use a different composition. Whereas with this camera movement, one photo, done. Don't need to spend any time in Photoshop. Straightforward. And another reason is, again, camera movement. So not only does this thing tilt forwards and backwards, it also moves up and down like this. Now, if you think about, if you've ever shot photos of buildings like this one here, you point the camera up, and then when you look at the image, it looks like the buildings are falling over. When we're walking around, our, our brain is very good at correcting this. We don't think the buildings are falling over. But when you look at this image, they're kind of a little bit falling over. And we can trivially fix that in software. So this is literally clicking one button in Lightroom. And it, it fixes the image, but as you can see, there's quite a big compromise in what it has to do to fix the image, which affects what I can do. I have to obviously crop this image now, and then my composition is compromised. And what I do with this camera is, again, our back of the camera move, it stays exactly the same. And when we move the front of the camera up, we're kind of doing this. And the way the, the distance, obviously, it's from the top to the bottom increases, so we correct that perspective here. And I've used this in this photo here. So this was in the, the harbour in Imperia. And I kind of like this contrast of the Louis Vuitton yacht with these really old cranes in the background. And had I done the old point the camera up with these cranes, they would look like they were falling over. And they wouldn't be. Here they're quite dominant in the frame, and they're kind of almost reaching over this boat. And if they were falling over, the, the entire point of the photo would be compromised. One of the problems with using this camera is the, the aperture, the iris of the, the lens is very, very small. So if you think about when you take a photo, if you're taking a photo in here, you probably can expose it for a short enough time that you're not going to have people blurred or camera shake. The lighting's not too bad in here, and cameras these days tend to be pretty good. Um, the problem with this camera is I'm using slow speed film and it's a very, very small aperture, which means the exposure times tend to be way longer. So before this talk, I did actually shoot a photo, and the exposure time was 15 seconds. Um, so you have to think about that. And there's an even greater problem, because it's a chemical process. Now, normally, the relationship is reciprocal. If you have half the amount of light, it takes twice as long the exposure. 10 times, 10 times longer, whatever. But the chemical process does break down after a certain point. We have this thing called reciprocity failure. And the curve of that exposure time goes quite steep quite quickly. It starts to go exponential. And I even have an app on my phone to help me with this. So the example here is this film. The app is saying, Oh, your light meter is, is saying you should expose this for one minute, but actually, because of the reciprocity failure, you have to do it for two and a half minutes. So you have to kind of factor this in in how you do your exposures. I'll just shift this camera out that I know. So you really start to think about what's going to happen in front of the camera when I'm doing this exposure, because it's 15 seconds, it's two minutes, it's however long. It's longer than you would normally take a photo for. And some photographers have actually used this in their projects, either conceptually or just as a limitation. And I've got a few examples here. So this is Mark Power, who shot a project on the building of the Millennium Dome. And the final photo is a four-second long exposure. 
that spans two millenniums. So it's two seconds before midnight and two seconds after midnight. And nobody has ever shot a photo like this, and nobody ever will shoot a photo like this. And you can call me out in 981 years if somebody else does shoot a photo like this. Um, <laughs> so this is Murray Fredericks who wanted to, he said he wanted to point his camera into nothing. And he would travel into the central, he did over several years he visited this dead salt lake in Australia. He would, he would cycle using a, a fat bike um, 15 kilometers into the middle of the lake and then go through all this process to shoot a photo, shoot a photo of nothing. So these, these are exposures that are several minutes long because obviously I mean, there's nothing there anymore, uh, anyway, but the kind of dragging the exposure really smooths everything out. And they're almost kind of like abstract paintings, but they are photos. And this is Adam Katzeff, who he wanted to shoot a photo of darkness, which sounds a little absurd, but if you think about when it's dark, your eyes adjust and you start to see all the details. And actually, you can see this on this projector. So he was shooting just after sunset, 30 minute long exposures. And he, he experimented for years with exposure techniques, film development, and I have no, no idea how he does this. I mean, I've shot my own black and white film and developed it for two decades, and I, don't, I just haven't got a clue how he does this. Um, but these, some of these are really beautiful photos, and they do feel like darkness. Yeah, I don't think he'll reveal his technique, to be honest. <laughs> um, this is Hiroshi Sugimoto, who, again, this is a bit absurd when you think about it. He wanted to shoot a photo that captured an entire movie, so about an hour and a half, two hours. Obviously, that's slightly absurd, but what happens is you end up getting the screen illuminates the, the auditorium, and you get all the details in the auditorium. This is quite a famous um, series that he did in lots of different old theatres and auditoriums. There probably are people in it, but again, they, they tend to move around and they go and... like in these photos. So this is Atta Kim, and he wanted to shoot famous landmarks, but he wanted to erase all the human presence. So when we take... traditionally we think photo is about recording the presence of something, but here we're using photography to remove the presence of something. So these are about eight hour long exposures. So obviously Times Square, you can kind of see on the bottom the hustle and bustle, but it all kind of smudges away. So that's an, that's an eight hour exposure, and how much longer do you think we can go with a, a single exposure? So this is Michael Wesley who shoots photos, single photos that span multiple years. This is a construction of the MoMA between August 2001 and May 2003, so they, they knocked down the MoMA and rebuilt it, and he set up a series of cameras to record that construction in a single image. And you can kind of see some of the details on there where they were obviously building the entire thing. He, he does this a lot. Um, I actually brought his book with me, which is really interesting to look at. This is the construction of the Dresden Bank in Frankfurt, July 2002, June 2003. And it's, just, it's literally a single exposure. Yeah. Again, his, his technique is very... He he's very closely guards it because he spent 10, 15 years to figure out how to do this. Because he gets into problems with the film, will, the temperature will affect the film, will shift, and the emulsions will, will shift. So he, he, he has his own technique. Um, The thing is that none of this is new. This is a this is a daguerreotype from 1838, when Louis Daguerre actually is. This is a year before he revealed the technique, um, and this is about a five-minute-long exposure. Um, it's also believed to be the first photo of a human presence, because if you look in the bottom left-hand corner, you can see there's somebody having their shoes shined. So they were stood for long enough to be recorded. Obviously this was a very busy street, but people were moving and they just kind of disappear from the image. There's also be some, some art historians believe he actually set this up because who would stand and have their shoes shine for more than five, ten minutes, but it is a human presence. So I've kind of been experimenting with 
these kind of exposures over the last year or so. So I'll just, I'll just quickly go through a few examples. This again is Silverstone. This is when people rush onto the, the course after the, the Grand Prix ends. They open the gates. Um, this is dusk in Monton. So I was just shooting out into the sea. Again, kind of that Marie Fredericks, a photo of nothing. This was in Tigne last year. This, I was in a chalet next to the piste, and this piece basher kept me awake at night. So I thought, oh, I'm going to go shoot a photo of it because I can't sleep. So this is a piece basher going up and down the, the piece. <sighs> yeah, these are all, so these are my photos now, yeah, sorry. Um, this was at the Swiss Pearl Workshop last year. So this was when Julian gave his talk. And I, I, I think it's kind of interesting that everybody fidgets a little bit. And then there is my colleague, Walter, who is sat there just a complete rock for about 40 minutes. So that's, that's kind of interesting. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't think he was asleep. His eyes are open if you look at the photo. It's something kind of obvious. Um, this is me at home shooting a self-portrait. I kind of got bored, though, and wandered off. So this was about an hour long. You can see I actually did. You can, can you see it? Yeah, you can see I picked my tea up and drank my tea and put the cup, up now, cup, cup back down. So we've got kind of this kind of history in this, this photo. And I moved the book. And, but all of the things these photos share in common is the, the camera stays where it is and the things in front of it move and wander off or don't wander off. And I kind of thought, why don't we flip that idea? Again, this is nothing new. I mean, people have been using panning techniques since the days of cameras. This is shot from my balcony, and this was what first gave me the idea. Uh, I think on their own, both of these pictures aren't quite interesting, but when you combine them into a diptych, they, they do kind of look more interesting, because the, the mountain in the background, which you can just about make out the Grand Mouveron, it disappears. And what really spurred this idea was um, Steve Bertrand's blog post about using a Raspberry Pi to pan cameras. He's using it because he has cameras set up way out in the sticks, and he doesn't want to walk out and move them. So he has some under remote control where he can just move the cameras to point them where he needs to. And there was even a successful Indiegogo campaign about a Pearl Plus Pi ebook that he did. So I grabbed that. I had a Raspberry Pi sitting around, a Raspberry Pi Zero sitting around. Um, that I never, I thought, what can I use this for? And then I saw all this, and OK, I'll try it. And the first thing I needed to do was hit it with a hammer, because it didn't come in with any of the connectors. So I needed to add the connectors. And I managed to do that without destroying the Pi. Um, I mean, it's only five euros, but you're still quite paranoid when you're hitting electronics with a hammer. It's and this is the entire setup. So we have this Raspberry Pi Zero. We have a stepper motor, which does a panning thing. We have a little battery pack, and then uh, a USB dongle, which is also a Wi-Fi receiver. And then I needed to install the software. So I grabbed the Raspberry Pi stepper motor distribution from CPAN. There's loads of these, obviously, on CPAN. And it didn't work very well because the dependencies were not up to date. So it was trivial to git clone the repo, build it again, and install it. And then the library itself is really easy to use. As long as you've wired everything up correctly and you've got enough power to actually drive the Pi and the motor, it's, if you ignore the boilerplate, it's constructing a method and just calling a couple of, constructing an object and calling a couple of methods on it. Turn it 180 degrees, turn it 240 degrees, set the speed to whatever speed you want, it's that simple. Yep. It's really straightforward. And now I said this was a work in progress, so what I need to do now is you saw the coupler there on the on the stepper motor. I need to somehow get it attached to this thing. Now, this looks quite big and heavy, but the tripod is actually very good. It's got a very smooth, very light movement. So I think there'll be, I think there'll be enough torque to actually pan the camera. I need to build a little rig to do that. 
And then I need to get to the connect to the Raspberry Pi. So I had I bought a I bought a Pi Zero W or Pi Zero, the one that has a YLAN basically. So that will solve that problem. Then write an interface, so just an, and probably a little RESTful API to do this, and then shoot some photos of mountains. And hopefully I will have, within the next year or two, a photo series of moving mountains. Any questions? Yeah, the camera does tilt shifts, rises, falls, swings. Yeah, it just goes all over the place. Any more questions? Yeah. Yeah, so astrophotography, they obviously have panning rigs to kind of prevent what I'm trying to achieve here. So they, they fix on a you know, the, the star and they, those rigs tend to be very expensive, um, multiple hundreds if not thousands of, of euros. And how well I would be able to connect it to this camera is, I don't know, I, but I, I do, I am aware of them. I mean, my aim here was to do this for less than 50 euros. Um, yeah. Any more questions? No? Oh, yeah. So the camera is, the camera and the lens and the tripod was about a thousand euros. Most of the most of the money is actually the lenses because literally this is just a box. It's just a light tight box. You put film in one end and put a lens on the other. So it's actually and there is a company now called Intrepid that will make one of these for about two hundred euros. You just need to put your own lens on the front. Yeah, I'm thinking about what's what's the best approach. And I might just build a little a little rig that kind of goes between the tripod head and the the tripod connector, and just just do something there. Yeah, yeah. So I literally just want to do just do that, and you can see how much. I mean, it's. It's very smooth movement, so it shouldn't. There should be plenty of torque there, and that's basically that's what I want to do. So, a five-second exposure, just have the stepper motor, just do that. And I will need to play around with exposure times and to figure out how this is going, and then how to present the photos. And shall I do a double exposure where one is plain exposure and the other is like that? This. No, I don't want it to do three three sixty now. Yeah. Yeah, I've played around with kind of putting the stepper motor here and having a little bit of string that does this, and yeah. Nick? By double exposure, do you mean blank or half? Do it actually do it in the camera as too Yeah, basically, yeah. Can you repeat that to the... Yeah, so Nick asked about the double exposure, and maybe I'll do half and half. Half is still and half is panned, and maybe it's a full exposure, and then on top of that, we do the panning, and like I say, it's I have the idea. I've shot some test photos, now I need to... Do the the rest of the work. So this is done with film physically, not Photoshop. Yeah, all done with all, no Photoshopping, but other than scanning the photos into the computer. Are you worried for all the stepper Yeah, this is what I don't know. I, the stepper motor it does seem to move quite smoothly, so I don't think it's. And even if it did, that would be quite interesting if it if it literally stepped. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and it would be interesting to see, because a lot of this kind of photography is you don't know what you're going to get until you try it, and then it's kind of like, oh, this is really interesting, or actually, no, this is not that interesting, and I don't. It's kind of an unknown at the moment. So. Film material very expensive. Yeah, the film the film costs about the black and white film costs me about five francs a sheet. That's one sheet plus all the development. So, um, but you only with this camera you shoot one photo. You don't shoot twenty, fifty photos. Jeez. So it actually it's not too bad. Okay, I think 
we're out of time. It, okay. Just okay. All right. Great. No more questions. Okay. Okay. Thank you, everybody.